and we're off. All right, Claire and I are gonna start us off this morning with a call to worship. As soon as I pull it up, here we go. The prophet Micah told us that the Lord requires us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. As we celebrate Martin Luther King's witness, let us be called to worship by some of the prophets of the civil rights movement. In 1963, in his challenging letter to complacent white clergy in the South, Dr. King wrote, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Oh God, we pray, transform our silence into action, our fear into courage. President John F. Kennedy, in an address that led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 said, the heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. Oh God, we pray, help us to love you and to love others as ourselves. Rosa Parks said, you must never be fearful about what you are doing when it is right. I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear. Knowing what must be done does away with fear. Oh God, we pray, remind us that you did not give us a spirit of fear. Anne Braden, a white Southern activist and ally of the civil rights movement wrote, in every age, no matter how cruel the oppression carried on by those in power, there have been those who struggled for a different world. I believe this is the genius of humankind, the thing that makes us half divine, the fact that some human beings can envision a world that has never existed. Oh God, we pray, help us to envision and struggle for a world where justice will roll down like water, righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Amen. Now we're gonna go into our, the hostess asks you to start your video. I don't know what that means. Sorry guys, technical issues. Um, now we're gonna go into our storying. So we will begin with looking at our symbol for the week. We're gonna have our video first, but then. All right, thanks Jeff. Uh -huh. <laughs> so here we go. Because the video will introduce the symbol. Yes, there we go. For the next two minutes, turn and share with someone next to you. What qualities do you look for in a close friend? Now, let your partner share.
Are you ready? Shh, quiet please. We're about to start. Now let's take a look back at our story so far. The Bible is a sacred story, echoed to us from the ancients. An epic, revealing the great creator's pursuit of wholeness for all of creation. May we find ourselves in this amazing story. The Creator, a great and mysterious being called God, filled the earth with light and land and every kind of creature, including humans, who reflected God's own image. Looking over creation, God thought, this is very good. Then, God set aside a day for humans to rest and enjoy being with God. God tried to protect the humans, but Adam and Eve gave in to temptation, believing they could have God's wisdom right away. Pain, struggle, and death entered their world. Later, Adam and Eve's son, Cain, killed his brother Abel in a jealous rage. So Cain was sent away to wander the earth. Before long, civilizations emerged, but humans filled the world with hatred and violence and God's heart broke. So God decided to start over by sending a flood. But God provided a plan for Noah to save each kind of creature. When the floods came, the ark floated safely on the surface. After the water receded, God stretched a rainbow across the sky as a promise of a new beginning. Then, God made this covenant with a man named Abraham. This land is for your family, which will be like the stars, too many to count. They'll be my blessing to the entire world. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, laughed in disbelief. We never could have children, and now we're too old. But they weren't too old for a miracle. After 25 years, they had Isaac, which means laughter. Isaac and Rebekah had twins. Esau, who foolishly traded his firstborn rights for a bowl of soup. And Jacob, who tricked their father into giving him Esau's blessing. But Jacob ran away because he feared Esau would kill him. Along his journey, a man sent from God wrestled with Jacob and renamed him Israel, meaning struggler with God. Later, Jacob returned, bowing to Esau. And Esau forgave him and welcomed him home. Israel had 12 sons, and his favorite was Joseph. But Joseph's brothers hated him and sold him into slavery. While captive, God gave Joseph the ability to interpret dreams. Pharaoh was so impressed that he made Joseph second in charge of Egypt. Not long after that, Joseph forgave his brothers and moved all of Israel's family to Egypt. Generations later, Israel's descendants started to fill Egypt. The new pharaoh felt threatened and forced them into slavery. So God rescued them with incredible signs and wonders. God also sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt. From atop a mountain, God gave the Israelites commands. These were special instructions in the best ways to live. But the people didn't listen and used a golden idol for worship. God did not abandon Israel and chose to dwell in the center of their camp in the tabernacle. 
God guided them through the desert with a pillar of fire at night and a towering cloud by day. Along the journey, the Israelites complained about being hungry and thirsty. So God answered, raining down manna, sending quail, and making water pour from a rock. But the Israelites still didn't trust God. So they had to wander in the desert for 40 years. Led by Joshua, Israel finally entered the Promised Land. God pushed back the Jordan River, opening a path to cross. To remember this miracle, the Israelites built a monument of stones. Then, the Israelites began to drive out the people living in the Promised Land. First, they marched around Jericho, whose walls crumbled with a loud shout, giving Israel victory. But soon, Israel began a terrible cycle of rebellion. They turned away from God and were conquered by their enemies. So God inspired judges to rescue them. One very wise judge named Deborah led Israel to drive out their arch enemy, the Canaanites. Another judge named Gideon sent a huge Midianite army into a panic, startling them with loud trumpets, smashing jars of clay to reveal flaming torches. But at the end of each judge's life, Israel returned right back to their evil ways. This terrible cycle continued for generations. During the time of the judges, tragedy struck Naomi, an Israelite woman. Her husband and both of her grown sons had died. But her daughter-in-law, Ruth, clung to Naomi and vowed to take care of her. Because they were poor, Ruth gathered leftover grain for food. The field owner, Boaz, was a wealthy relative of Naomi. He thanked Ruth for caring for Naomi and gave her grain and water. When Naomi heard about this, she sent Ruth to meet with Boaz. That night, Ruth snuck into where Boaz was sleeping and laid down by him. Later, Boaz awoke, startled. Ruth told him, Cover me with your blanket, for you are my family redeemer. This was symbolic. Ruth was asking him to marry her. Boaz was surprised and excited. He thought she would seek out a younger man. Soon, Boaz and Ruth were married and started a family. Years later, one of their descendants would become a king of Israel. In our next story, Israel gets what it asks for, a king. Let's continue this story right now. And that's where we begin our story this morning. So today's symbol for the story of Saul is a harp and a spear. So you can get out your sketching materials and do your best at drawing that symbol of a harp and a spear. We do this every week to help us focus on the story and to help us also look back and remember that story. Um, you can take a picture of your symbol that you're working on and you can share that through email so that we can share that um, with the email that goes out on Wednesday. So you can continue working on that symbol as we go through um, the rest of our storying today. We will begin with comparing the Bible to an object. This week we're talking about how the Bible is like musical instruments. A guitar is more than wood and strings. A trumpet is more than a brass horn. A piano is more than black and white keys. The musical instrument is made up of many parts that are tuned to work together. A specific tension of strings, an intricate arrangement of valves and levers, and mechanics of pedals and hammers that result in the reverberation and sound. The Bible is like 
a musical instrument. It is made up of many parts that work together, like the strings on a guitar, the valves on a trumpet, or the hammers on a piano. The stories in the Bible create a melody that invites us to find ourselves and its residents. The stories in the Bible create a melody that invites us to find ourselves in its, in its residence. We already read that part. Through the song of the Bible, though the song of the Bible seems to wander, it always returns to key melodies like restoration, love, blessing, and redemption. Before we go into the story, let's have a little bit of history behind it, looking into the about this story. Since leaving Egypt generations before, the ancient Israelites lived in 12 tribes. Though these tribes identified themselves as one people, each tribe had its own leadership. The judges were tribal leaders who provided legal, spiritual, and military direction. At different times, judges emerged as deliverers, like Deborah and Gideon rallying the tribal militia to defeat their enemies. But the Israelites grew tired of this loose system of leadership and even more tired of not having united army to fight off the constant threats from their enemies. They wanted a more permanent solution to their political and military troubles. They wanted a king. And that is where we find ourselves this morning as we prepare to imagine and listen to the story of Saul. So as we prepare for this this morning, clear your minds of all the other things that you're thinking about and prepare your imagination to think and to feel and really be in a part of this story this morning. If it helps, you can close your eyes or you can focus on a spot in the room or you can also choose to focus on the picture that is on the screen right now. Let's begin our story this morning. Scene one, from Judges to Kings. The people of Israel lived in 12 tribes scattered throughout the promised land of Canaan. And God rose up judges to rule and protect them from their enemies. Samuel was the last judge of Israel. From the time Samuel was a child, he sensed God speaking directly to him. Samuel challenged the Israelites. If you are serious about following God's ways, get rid of your idols. Follow God with your whole heart. Then God will rescue us from our enemies. For a season, the Israelites listened to Samuel and lived in God's ways and were freed from enemy control. When Samuel grew older, he appointed his sons to be the judges over Israel, but they were dishonest and took bribes. The people of Israel in insisted to Samuel, your sons are corrupt. Give us a king to lead us like the other nations have. So God gave Samuel the words to say to the Israelites. God will allow you to have your king, Samuel said, but this means you're rejecting God as king. So be warned, human kings will control you and take everything for themselves. But the people wouldn't listen and demanded, we must have a king just like the other nations, a king that will rule us and fight for us. So, God showed Samuel who would be their king. It was Saul, a very tall and handsome man from a wealthy family. Samuel took a small bottle of oil and poured it over Saul's head. This was called anointing, a custom to show that God had chosen Saul as king. God has made you ruler over all of Israel, Samuel said to Saul. God will help you to save them from their enemies who keep attacking from every side. Then Samuel presented the new king to the people and they all shouted, long live the king. Scene two, the foolishness of King Saul. 
At first, Saul was a powerful king who followed God's ways. Battle after battle, he led Israel in victory over their enemies. But Saul was impatient and wanted to lead his own way. He ignored the instructions God gave him for battle and for preparing offerings. Samuel scolded him. Why didn't you listen to God? You have been so foolish. Soon your kingdom will end and you will be replaced with someone who follows after God's own heart. God regretted making Saul king. So God said to Samuel, go in secret to visit a man named Jesse. His son will be the new king. Jesse was a descendant of Ruth and Boaz. When Samuel, he arri when Samuel arrived, he discovered that Jesse had seven sons. When Jenny Jesse introduced his oldest son to Samuel, Samuel thought, this must be the new king. But then Samuel heard God say, this isn't the new king. Don't just look at height and strength. People judge by outward appearance, but I look at the heart. One by one, Jesse introduced Samuel to his sons, but each time God told Samuel to move on to the next one. Finally, Samuel said to Jesse, are these all of your sons? Jesse replied, well, they're still the youngest, but he's just a boy. He's in the field tending the sheep. Bring him here, Samuel said. David was a healthy and handsome young man. When Samuel saw him, he heard God say, he is the one. So Samuel anointed David's head with oil and God's spirit gave power and direction to David from that day on. Scene three, Saul's madness. Saul knew his time as king would soon end and he grew very depressed and anxious. He had musicians play for him in hopes it would ease his troubled mind. One of these musicians was none other than David. He came to the palace every day to play his stringed instrument for the king. David's music helped Saul to feel better. Soon the king grew to love David and made him one of his most treasured servants. David also became close friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. In fact, David and Jonathan made a covenant to watch out for each other. Before long, King Saul appointed David to command his armies. David had great success in battle and became so popular that the Israelites sang songs about his greatness. This made Saul extremely angry and jealous. Why are they giving David all of the credit? Next, they'll make him king, he said. The next time David was playing music for him, King Saul became filled with madness. He picked up a spear and hurled it at David. David quickly dodged the spear and ran away. When Saul came to his senses, he realized that God was protecting David. Soon, Saul's daughter, Micah, fell in love with David. Saul pretended to be happy about this and gave his daughter to David to be married. But inside, Saul was filled with fear and hatred. King Saul publicly praised David for being a courageous warrior, but secretly, he hoped David would be killed in battle. But David became more and more popular with the Israelites and King Saul grew more and more jealous and crazy. Give you a few moments to process our story and then we'll go into a time of sharing with a few questions to prompt that sharing. Our first question is, what did you sense or see? 
what sticks out to you from the story? Well, what uh, sticks out to me is just the phrase, God regretted his decision. Um, that's, that's, a, that's something that's sticking out to me in that you know, God's supposed to have all-knowing power of the past, present, and future, right? Isn't, isn't that what we've been taught? Uh, but to hear God regretted his decision is, is interesting. And I think I'll have to think about that for a while. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's an interesting point. Yeah, it was kind of a flood redo. I mean, you know, the flood and the ark and all that. I mean, that was God saying, I'm going to start this whole thing over again. And this is just another version of that, isn't it? A little mini version of it. I think what stuck out to me was um, when he said not to judge by the outside characteristics that, you know, God judges by the inside. And here we are still, it's 2021, and we still have judgment happening by the outside characteristics. It's still amazing. We have not learned yet. All right, let's move on to our second set of questions. What does the story say about you? What does it say about humanity? I don't think we're ever satisfied and we always want more and we always want it faster and we don't seem to ever learn. On the other hand, as much as we screw things up, God's always out there to say, okay, guys, I mean, we're going to do it my way now. And his grace lets us, lets us keep continuing with him. Yeah. In what ways do you personally struggle to live in God's boundaries? And which of the characters in the story are you most like and how? You know, sometimes it's hard to see
see someone else uh, do actions or um, just live their life better than I think I am. Um, so I, I can identify with Saul getting jealous of seeing the ascendance of, of David. Um, I don't think I'm getting to the point of killing anybody. Uh, so you're all good. Um, but uh, I can I can definitely relate to um, the hint of jealousy. You know, I was the one who was anointed. You know, uh, why are all these good things happening to uh, this other person? And are they going to get to a point where the people want him uh, instead of me? Um, yeah. So I, I can definitely relate to Saul in, in this story. Yeah, I was Go ahead, thinking, Tim, sorry. Yeah, I was thinking, Jeff, if if, cra if jealous and crazy were the criteria, I'd, I'd be on that list somewhere. Yeah, I think that that's what jumped out to me, you know, as, as you listen to the story again with fresh ears is, you know, and that and that jealousies toward not not a stranger, right, but but someone who Saul should have loved, someone who's going to be his, his son-in-law, was his son's best friend, it was the commander of his army, uh, you know, he, he soothed him with music, all these great things that, that David did and all these reasons that Saul should have loved him, but, but yet the, the jealousy still kind of over, overcame Saul. Um, so that, that, I think that jumped out at me as from uh, speaking to, I think, human nature, right? And, and how, uh, how we tend to be. And... I think um, one thing I was going to share was just, uh, uh, you know, thinking about uh, how God uh, is um, um, just working in all of our lives um, from the, uh, I forget, something was shared earlier on. It's blanking now, but um, uh, but just about uh, how you know God. It's a reminder that God is um, cares about kind of the little details in our life. He cares about walking with us each and every step of our life, um, uh, and. Yeah, um, I'm blanking on something earlier, so, but I wanted to share that. Thanks, everyone. And John, if that comes back to you later, and if um, there's anything that anyone else wants to share that comes up throughout your week or maybe later this afternoon, you can um, add those in the comments on the Facebook page or you can email those in um, to the office email and then those can get, can get shared out that way. And those of you that are watching on Facebook Live, you can also share your comments on there as well. And we will, I'll be able to respond to those later. Now we're going to um, segue into um, ministry opportunities. I believe that about all that we have going on right now is um, start thinking and preparing about Family Promise coming the end of March. That will be um, our spring break week as well. Um, I don't know that we've heard yet if they're going to be housed in the church building or if they're still gonna be housed in hotels at that point, but start thinking about um, how we can minister to those families. Um, also, Coming up, we are doing donuts with dad at the preschool, but we're gonna do it a little bit differently um, to, to be safe um, for us and the families. We are just going to deliver donuts 
to the preschool, little individual packages um, with a little note that the kids can take those home and have a special time to share them with their dad um, safely at home. So we're still ministering in the way that we can um, to the preschool at this time. The other thing I can think of is we've started sending out a weekly letter. Um, Patrick's going to send out a couple and then a board member will send out one. I believe Ross is going to be the first board member to do that. Just kind of keep the conversation going on um, where we are going and moving as a church and that sustainability conversation. So be looking for those emails. And also, um, if you did not yet turn in your information for the church directory, um, we're, st we're still collecting that information. The elders will be reaching out to you to get that. But if you remember beforehand and want to shoot that in in an email, that would be great as well. Any other minister opportunities that I've missed? Okay, good. Blank stares from everybody. That means I didn't forget anything. Um, we will, after the um, Facebook live feed goes off, we will have a time of sharing at the end to share um, prayer and praise prayer and praises. You can also email those in or put those on the, the comments on Faith Life if you would like to do that as well. So those can get shared through the email that goes out on Wednesday. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Let me pull it up. Um, it's a prayer of confession um, adapted from a quote from Dorothy Day. And then after that, we will go into the Lord's Prayer together. So please join me in prayer. God of justice, we confess that in the pursuit of our own dreams and desires, we have not always been civil, not always humane, not always right. Guided by your spirit, what we would like to do is change the world, to make it a little simpler for people to feed, clothe, and shelter themselves as you intended them to do. Help us to be your witnesses by fighting for better conditions, by crying out unceasingly for the rights of workers, the poor, the destitute of the rights of the unworthy, the worthy and the unworthy poor, so that we can, with your help, change the world. Enlarge our hearts to love each other, to love our neighbor, and to love our enemy as our friend. Now please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. And our object lesson this morning is being shared via video, <clears throat> thanks to Susie Fouch. Good morning. Has everyone seen one of these before? Has anyone used one? It's a highlighter. <laughs> and what do we use highlighters for? Well, highlighters are an important thing. Students can use highlighters when they're studying for school. If you're reading your notes or a book and come across something you want to remember, you might just highlight that little section. Then when you go back and study, that important passage will jump right at you because it's a different color. Sometimes a person at their job might use a highlighter to mark something they want to remember. Or if they're reading a long report for their boss, they might use the highlighter to mark something very important for their boss to see. Can anyone think of any other examples of how we might use a highlighter? Has anyone ever seen someone mark their Bible with a highlighter? That can be a very valuable tool for us as we study God's word. If you find a verse that's really meaningful or important to you, you can highlight it so it will catch your attention or so you can find it again. But you know, there's another way we can highlight scripture in our lives and that's to memorize it. Memorizing is just like highlighting scripture in your heart. When you're feeling down, you can remember a verse about joy. Or when you need to resist temptation, you can recall a verse standing strong about standing strong in God, with God. Now, Psalm 119, 105 says, 
Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Just as a highlighter brings the words on a page to light, God's word lights the steps of our lives. Sounds like a good verse to highlight in our hearts, doesn't it? Repeat it with me. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Repeat that same verse tonight and every night this week. Then every week recite that verse at least once. Then start memorizing other verses. The more of God's word you can, word that you can highlight in your life, the more you will find yourself walking in his light. Remember Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Bye. Thanks, Susie. Now get your communion elements ready as Megan is going to lead us in our time of communion this morning. Good morning. Um, sorry, I'm home alone with the dogs. So if they get crazy, I'm really gonna apologize for it now. Um, but I, am, I don't have a big message for you guys this morning. I'm just gonna do the words of institution. So I'll give you a second to get your um, elements ready. Matthew 26, 26 tells us, while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. As you go this morning, I would like to leave you with a benediction, seemed appropriate since tomorrow is um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a benediction from Martin Luther King Jr. Lord, we thank you for your church, founded upon your word that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depends on us and not just upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together. Until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity. In the reign of our Lord, and our God, we pray, amen. May the Lord be with each and every one of you this week. Go in peace.